It's week 18 of my Summer with Lisa Claypis challenge. It's the last week. I can't believe it. And this week we are reading the book I've never read before in the series, Devil in Disguise. Hi, my name's B. Welcome to my channel, Mama Needs to Read Romance, because nobody in this book is going to pour their cereal all over the floor because they're done. emotions about this week. I can't even begin to tell you. I am so excited to be getting to this book because I have never read it before. It was published most recently, last year in 2021, and this is Merritt, who is the daughter of Lillian and Marcus from the Wallflower series. I could not be more excited. What's so funny, her name is Merritt because as you may remember from It Happened One Autumn, or no, I think the baby was born in a different book, actually. If you remember, let me know in the comments. It might have been Scandal in Spring, Daisy's book. But Merritt, is the name of the vet that came to <laughs> to help Lillian when she was in labor with Merritt. <laughs> So they decided to name their baby after the vet who saved the day because none of the doctors were able to come in that storm. Remember that? But I digress. We have a very exciting book. I also got the audio of this from the library. Mary Jane Wells is going to be narrating. The love interest in this is Scottish. His name is Keir McRae. This blows out of the water my prediction that Raphael, the son of Sebastian and Evie, you know, because every book that has Sebastian and Evie in it always has the devil in the the title. And I thought, oh, this is going to be Raphael, the son that was never in any of the books, but they always talked about him. He's finally coming into, into the plot somewhere. And wouldn't it be fun for Evie and Sebastian's son to marry Lillian and Marcus's daughter? Well, no. Lisa Claypus did not think so. Apparently everybody wants to get poor little Merritt into a scandal and she's tried very hard not to let that happen. But apparently Keir McRae is such a hottie Mac Hodderson that she is not going to be able to resist. He's trying to resist her as well as making sure he doesn't get killed. And apparently he doesn't know why until fate reveals his secret identity. Is it Raphael? No, I don't see how that could make any sense. But I thought about that for a millisecond. <laughs> Anyway, I am so excited to read this this week. There will be spoilers after this point. I'm going to be telling you as we go what's happening in the story. At some point, I'm going to tell you this song that I believe would be Merit and Cure's love theme. And at the end, I will give it a rating. So let's do this one last time. I think this book is crazy, like my appearance and my room. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's been a long Saturday. It's October 1st as I'm filming this and we've been stuck in the house all day because of the storm coming through the East Coast. So trying to keep everybody entertained is not easy <laughs> at all. At least I got this book, although I'm telling you, I'm really surprised. I mean, I'm loving Mary Jane Wells doing Keir McRae's Scottish accent. We meet him as he's covered in whiskey. I almost said rum. I don't know much about different types of alcohol. It's terrible. But anyway, it, there's a huge problem with his shipment. And Merritt is the widow of uh, Sterling, Lord Sterling, I believe. And they've been married for about a year and a half before he was lost at sea. And there's something about him that she feels like she remembers a bit, which I don't understand what that is at all or what that's going to mean. But I don't know if it's just that they're sort of soulmates or they're going to be I don't know I don't think she knew him before it's weird <clears throat> anyway she and her younger brother Josh I think his name is no that can't be right Luke she and her younger brother Luke they work together with the shipping company that used to be her husband's and anyway she's just not really ruffled at all by just about anything but Kier comes in and it is insta lust I shall say the two of them, the way they were thinking about each other, their thoughts, I was like, wow, Lisa Klepas, you are coming in hot, I guess. I mean, it's just, whoa, really intense between the two of them right off the bat, super chemistry. She, because he's, he's having so much trouble with his shipment, they've decided to help him find uh, accommodations. She walks him to a place he can stay. She tries to help him with like his bath or something. And then it starts to sort of explode and he gets covered in water. And then they're like really close and wet. And um, it's pretty hot, but not, no, not hotter than a few minutes later when she accidentally says out loud that she wants him to kiss her. And they've just met. <laughs> 
And so he does. And he kisses her, not like the first time, but like it's going to be the last time as Lisa Kleypas writes. It's very intense. So the following day, she's looking for him again. And she talks about how they could be friends. She wants to have him over to her home. And he's like, you could never just be my friend. And then he starts kissing her again. And she feels how excited he is by all of this. And yeah, I mean, it's pretty crazy. We will see what happens next in chapter five. Looking rough again and have gum in my mouth. I'm so sorry. It's crazy. We have a family emergency just trying to get by. I didn't know if I could even listen to the book because it's pretty stressful right now around here, but the mystery that is going on caught my attention and I'm glad because I needed a little diversion. Isn't it great how books like this can sort of take you out of your stress for a little bit? I love it. I love it. But it's like, what in the world is going on? So this is chapters five through nine I'm talking about. And Oh my gosh. Okay. First of all, Kier goes to Jenner's and meets Sebastian as he's trying to sell his whiskey. And Sebastian's like, no, I'm not really interested. And then he looks at Kier, it gives him kind of an odd look, and then he drinks it. And he's like, oh, it's good. What is going on? What is going on with this guy? Apparently, well, okay, let me, let me, let me move on a little bit first because I got something else to say. This is just crazy. So, then Kier goes to a barber. He's going to get a haircut and he's going to, he off, the barber offers to shave his beard. And it's, it's, he says that he can't. And his roundabout way of saying that he can't is he's too handsome to lose the beard. <laughs> oh, life must be so hard, Kier. I feel for you. Then, okay, now actually life does get hard because he goes off, he's heading over to Merritt's soon for dinner, really looking forward to that, and he gets stabbed in an alley. Some guy pulls him into an alley and stabs him. If it hadn't been for one of the bottles of whiskey in his pocket, I mean, he could have died. Thankfully, I guess, he decides to go to Merritt's after this because he just wants to see her even though he's been stabbed. And Merritt pulls him inside, calls Dr. Garrett Gibson over. And Garrett stitches him right up, fixes him up. And um, she finds it odd. He actually has the knife on him. And it's the knife of someone from the military. And she's like, okay, this is super weird. This guy sees you, a huge guy. He decides to take you on himself with a knife. That's not just some random robber type thief knife. It's a really nice knife unless he stole it from somebody else. It just doesn't make any sense. And Merritt's like, well, maybe you could ask Ethan. But guess what? Ethan's not even around. Do you know where he is? He's in Scotland because Sebastian asked Ethan to investigate something over there. What is going on? I have a theory. I'm afraid to say it, though, because I don't want to ruin anything. I'm thinking about the title of the book again, Devil in Disguise. Something's up. Something's up. Okay, and then what else is there? Oh, good night. Okay, again, remember talk, I talked about the insta-lust. These guys are really, really into one another. They have dinner together. It gets hot and heavy. And basically, the, the Merritt invites him to spend the night. And he tries to sort of, like, shake her off by being really lewd about how he would take her. Didn't bother her at all. Didn't phase her in a bit. She calls his bluff, and, and, uh, and he's like, do you know what you're risking being with me? And she goes, yeah, I just want to see if it's worth it. And he goes, well, then I'm going to make it worth it. And that's the end of chapter nine. This book is bananas. And let's see what happens next. Chapters 10 through 14. And you're back in the car. And I'm sorry, it's another day. But my boys have therapy, OT, and speech right now, so I'm trying to get a couple things done at the same time. Merritt, who Kier has now started calling Mary, as in happiness, the two of them share a very passionate night, and it's hilarious. She talks about how big his feet are, and we all know what that means. It's even to a point where he's like, no, I'll hurt you. 
<laughs> like, oh my. Anyway, but it's very passionate. The two of them are very, they don't have much in the way of inhibitions, let's just say. And so they have a very nice time, but they decide, you know, this is it. The, the, part of the reason they're so passionate is because they know they're never going to be together again. However, at the last minute, she decides to make sure that he does not leave the station, shall I say. So it's like, well, what is that about? That you're both just okay with that, even though you're going your separate ways. Now she could be pregnant. I mean, what? So, I mean, this whole book is just insane. He leaves. Fast forward a smidge. He is in a room above the warehouse and he hears explosions. Someone, we find out later, has committed arson to try to basically fast forward a little bit. He's in his room above the warehouse. He's deciding he's going to go see Merritt because he just can't stay away. And someone blows up the warehouse. He jumps out a window just in time. But Ethan tells us later on, Ethan Ransom, of course, everybody's favorite detective, my favorite detective, at least. Ethan tells Merritt that it was on purpose. It was arson. Someone is trying to kill Kier and we don't know why. And Sebastian and Ethan both show up at Merritt's house while Dr. Gibson is trying to ke treat Kier for his injuries that he sustained jumping out a window of the warehouse. And Sebastian and, Ke and Ethan definitely know something. They're not telling Merritt what's going on. And she really wants to know, but she's noticing as she's looking at Sebastian, there are certain physical characteristics in Sebastian's face that she recognizes in Kier's which is interesting. Also huge, Kier tells Merritt that he was adopted. So are you getting what's happening here? I think I know. I have a feeling, but I don't want to say anything just in case. Oh, and I was so disappointed. Merritt said she wanted to take him home. Kier needs to leave London in order to be safe because somebody's trying to kill him. So she decides to take him to Stony Cross Park. And I was like, oh my gosh, Stony Cross Park? Are you serious? We haven't been there in forever. I think the last time we were at Stony Cross Park was maybe the second Hathaway's book when they went, when Beatrix stole Merritt as a baby, her horse. I'm trying to remember. It was a toy horse. It was not an actual horse that Beatrix stole. Remember, she was a kleptomaniac if you've read those, that series. I, but I digress. So that should be the name of my channel, right? But I digress. Sebastian says, you know what? Evie and the two youngest kids are on vacation. Let's take Kier to my home. Sebastian is very invested in, in Kier without even knowing him. Gee, I wonder why. Let's see what happens next. bedtime and I totally forgot to do this today. It's been such a crazy day. I didn't want today to pass without me telling you what happened until chapters 22. Holy cow. All right. So it comes to light that Sebastian is in fact Kier's father. So Sebastian, before he met Evie, he had an affair with an aristocratic woman. She had a trust fund. She was loaded in her own right apart from her husband. So she was really unhappy in her marriage to this wretched, wretched man. So she has this affair with Sebastian. She gets pregnant and she is terrified of what her husband's going to do if he finds out that he, this baby is not his. Because if the baby would inherit everything and the wretched husband would not. So she goes off. She has the baby. She gives it to an older couple and lies to her husband and says that it was the baby was stillborn to protect him. Well, because not long after that, well, years and years and years after that, Sebastian learned that the baby did live. Unfortunately, another party found out as well and that everybody's trying to track Kier down. Sebastian just wants to meet his son, whereas the other party that's trying to track Kier down is, of course, related to the husband of Kier's biological mother who wants all the money, all the, all the land, all of that for himself, because obviously it would go to Kier. So craziness finding this out. By the way, they're at Heron's Point now, and Merritt is doing her darndest to continue to nurse him back to health. 
and Heron's Point. It's so neat to be there. They even go to the beach where Gabriel and Pandora started falling in love. I love that. But it's a lot of awkward. I mean, Phoebe is there and she's sort of trying to act like a sister figure sort of to Kier, which he finds very awkward. And he is finding out now, if the lineage is correct, that he is not Scottish at all, which is very upsetting to him. Phoebe says, you're going to be, we'll just keep going back in your ancestors, ancestry. I'm sure you're as Scottish as a leprechaun on a unicorn riding through a field of thistle. And he's like, leprechauns are Irish. Mare is devastated because she feels like here's yet another hurdle for them to never be able to jump over in terms of potentially forming a relationship when she sees Kier with his niece, half niece, and he is adorable with this baby. West's baby. West and Phoebe's baby. I love it. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't see what the deep connection is they had one night and you know now he has amnesia so he doesn't remember her at all I mean they had like one night together they knew each other for a couple days and I mean I don't really get there's this deep soul connection which is for me a little bit of a disappointment but I guess it's great that they have chemistry so to each their own I suppose in any case I'm looking forward to more in chapter 23 23 through 27. There's several things to talk about in terms of relationships here. Now, Kier develops a much stronger relationship with Sebastian. They are understanding one another a little bit better. Sebastian regrets not being in Kier's life. And he actually says that if he could thank Kier's late adopted father, he would kiss his feet for what he did for Kier. Which just, I mean, Sebastian and Evie, when she comes back from vacation, make this book for me. <laughs> I mean, they really do. There is a reason why they're in every segment. Well, actually, somebody else from The Wallflowers comes back in a moment, but let me die. let me talk about something else first. Continuing on about relationships. Um, you know, it's interesting. Matt Merritt is our third widow in the Ravenel series, and there's seven books, and three of this of the seven gals are widows. You've got Kathleen who obviously she was only a bride for a few days, but her relationship with Theo was super contentious. And we understand that. And then we have Phoebe who, you know, she was childhood sweethearts with Henry and it ripped her to pieces when he passed away. And she took two years to really recover. Now, Merritt also being a widow, we know that she was married to Josh for a year and a half, but I don't really have a sense of how she felt about him, how she was dealing with the loss. I, I feel like her relationship with Josh is sort of an enigma. There, there's just not that much discussion about it because she has such insta love for Kier. It just makes me wonder what her relationship with Josh was like, honestly. She finally does open up to Kier and say, I'm really sorry, I know you want children, but I was never able to conceive and the doctor told me I have fibroids in my uterus. So it's very unlikely I could ever conceive and I know that's gonna be a deal breaker for you because I, you know, you want children and I can't provide that for you. And he got really angry and said, are you gonna say that what I had with my adopted parents wasn't real? Which I was like, what, is, what are you talking about? That's not anything like what she said. And then he says, well, we could adopt. But it was just kind of a crazy conversation and it was something that needed to be had too because after his am he you know he has am did I mention that he has amnesia after falling out of that warehouse or jumping out of the warehouse he doesn't know who she is and she's telling everybody that they're engaged they have known each other for what a couple days like 2 days they have basically a one night stand and she is totally head over heels for him and is pining away at the fact that he's trying to keep himself at a distance from her well I have to say, okay, so I was getting irritated with this book, but Lisa Klebus does something right. As he's leaving with Phoebe in the carriage, he's going through his wallet and he discovers a piece of paper that Merritt typed her name and his name on a piece of paper and he had kept it. Well, all of a sudden, all these memories come rushing back of himself with Merritt. And I say all these, it's like one night worth of memories because <laughs> they've had basically one night together. And he, he's like, Mary, which is of course what he called her. 
Like there's this long-term nickname he had for her for the one day that they knew each other. And he jumps out of the carriage and rushes back into her arms. And that really was, I thought that was done very well. And then <laughs> they proceed. I mean, they have this lovely conversation. It's so funny because now they're completely reversed. Merritt was, we, I have, I have to have you. And he's like, no, we can never be together. And now he comes back remembering everything, all of the one thing day and he's like we have to be together and she's like it could never work and i'm just like what is going on it gets crazier by the way they proceed to have intimacy they're trying to be careful because of his ribs still and i never in a million years would have thought that i would see this in a historical romance well or at least a Clapis. but they perform an act. It's a number. They perform a number. And I don't mean like a musical number. I'll say this. It's a number between 68 and 70. Do you get what I'm saying? They do this. <laughs> I'm like, what? I never thought I would read that in a Elisa Kleypas historical romance. But there you have it. Okay, interesting. Right after this, they are still very much together in bed and who shows up but Lillian. She walks in on them, and that is where chapter 27 ends. So the insanity just doesn't end with this book. even know where to begin. This is up to chapters 30, 34, <clears throat> I believe, or 33. I don't, I have mixed feelings. I am loving the Wallflowers reunion that is happening. It's like they've got Marcus and Lillian, Sebastian and Evie. I think those are probably the two couples that people care most about, the, the ones that we've seen over and over again. And it was just lovely. Lillian and Sebastian have a wonderful conversation and decide truly to part as friends. The thing that precipitated the conversation though, I thought was ridiculous. Lillian was making it about her that Sebastian had told Marcus and had Marcus not tell Lillian that Sebastian had a secret son. And Lillian's like, I can't believe no one told me. Lillian, this is not about you. <laughs> oh, Lillian, how on brand. Anyway, but they had a great conversation and Sebastian and Marcus too, watching the two of them drink brandy and chat. I just loved it. And I loved seeing Evie and Lillian together rehashing old times. The wallflower stuff is making this book for me because let me tell you, it's not Kier and Merritt. I'm so disappointed. They have another love scene and he sticks his finger up her area where the sun don't shine against her will, sort of. I mean, he doesn't ask permission. She did not like it. And he, he knew what he was doing. I so wanted to love this. And I just don't buy that their love is based on anything other than a conversation in bed or over dinner. It's this insta love thing that I'm just not really, I'm just not really into this. And it just is really disappointing. And again, like another awkward sex scene. I just didn't care for it. I feel like if this was the first Lisa Kleypas I ever read, I would say, okay, she's not for me. It's such a disappointment. The other theme of the section that I've been reading is Kier is basically a puppet. I feel for him, honestly. I feel badly for him. He's going to have to take the trust, and he's also going to have to claim that uh, Lord Ormond, who wants him dead, is his father, even though he's not, but legally because he was married to Lady Ormond. He's going to have to say that Lord Ormond is his father, which Kier doesn't want to do. Ethan says, look, we need you to be bait and we need you to go back to Isla and Merritt wants to go with him. He says that she can, uh, but then he leaves a day early. So uh, anyway, it's just not loving this, but the scene between Sebastian and Kier where they realize that the key that Kier has carried around his neck since his mother gave it to him. And of course he never knew his mother. 
um, it fits in the lock that Sebastian has. And they both got really emotional when they turned the lock, which I thought was really neat. But yeah, so now I'm just gonna finish the book. By the way, do you know how you take a walk when you listen to Lisa Kleypas? With ground-eating strides, of course. Well, I just finished the book. What a ride, I tell ya. Again, the wallflowers made it for me. It, I, I wanna do the epilogue now, but I have to wait. So Merritt follows Kier <clears throat> to Isla, against his wishes, of course, he's already there. And she gets sick on the way over there. And the people that are traveling with her recognize right away that she is in a hopeful condition, I think they said. And they are furious with Kier. <laughs> they basically escort Merritt to Kier's home and say, you better make an honest woman out of her. So they go to the sheriffs and they say their vows. Kier has to pay a fine because they don't even have wedding bands. And, and Kier actually says, well, how about I give you whiskey instead? The sheriff says, okay, fine wave, which I thought was hilarious. But you can really see that they really truly love each other. I just hope it's, I, I shouldn't be cynical, but it's like, I just didn't see as much build for it. But I mean, they do love each other. So if they were just soulmates and it's meant to be, let's just go with that. <laughs> um, yeah. And so they have, basically it's like a little honeymoon because they don't have anything to do. They're just sort of waiting because Sebastian went to court and, and told everybody that he, that he found Kier because Sebastian was the executor of Lady Ormond's will. So Sebastian has told everybody who Kier is, and he said, uh, Sebastian told Kier that, you know, you don't have to worry at all about being in society because you are one of the highest, um, in terms of lineage, you have a really great lineage on both sides. So you're all set. So don't worry about that. But um, they get some crazy news. Lord Ormond, who was the one who they believe hired the hit on Kier, died. They found him dead in his home. So it's like, okay, well now I guess, there's no more cause for concern, or is there? So they're in their home one night and the dog starts going crazy and there's someone, there's an intruder. So they go into the whiskey distillery and they hear someone. They wind up pulling levers and these casks of whiskey go down on the floor and basically sort of, they don't kill him, but they sort of crush this guy. So they capture him. He's not really willing to talk, but it turns out he's the second hitman that was hired by Ormond. The first hitman was the one who killed Ormond because he was mad that Ormond was going to refuse to pay him. I assume the second hitman was unaware that Ormond had died. So anyway, now Kier realizes because Ormond is dead, he actually inherits everything, the estates, the earldom, I believe, and the trust. So he's got all this land. He's got this huge manor. And Merritt gives him the idea that they turn the manor into a school. And they go on about how amazing teachers are. And all my, my teacher friends and I would probably be swooning at this part. <laughs> um, so Lisa Kleypas, well done. All your teacher fans are very appreciative of the lovely things that you had Merritt say about teachers at the end. That was great. Uh, but yeah, I so, you know, they're married now. They're very happy. She's going to have a baby, which I love the ending so much. It's Christmas at Stony Cross Park. I would love another book of just that. Can we do that? Oh my gosh. Anyway, so Sebastian and Marcus are there. They're, they're just such good friends and they're just reveling in all their families being together for the Christmas season. And they're talking about the news and it, you know, they, they're sharing what they've learned, which is Merritt and Kier are arriving early because Merritt is in the family way. And you realize this child is, uh, is descended from Sebastian and Marcus. Those are going to be the two grandfathers. How cool is that? I just love that so much. And Sebastian and Marcus are saying they both hope that the baby gets 
Marcus's brains, but Sebastian's looks. <laughs> I just love it. And how interesting. This is the first time that Lisa Kleypas has closed the epilogue, not with the couple that was the main couple, but with the wallflowers. And, and that's, you know what, I'm going to go down in history, like I'm that important, saying this book for me is about the wallflowers. It's a wallflower reunion of the two, I'm guessing, more popular couples of the four. And in terms of that, for me, I would say five stars. I loved all of the scenes with them. The scenes without them were really lacking too awkward, too aggravating for me, honestly. So I'm going to go ahead and give this book, I'm going to say 3.5 stars uh, because there were some good love scenes. And I don't actually mean the love making scenes because mostly those were, those were not my favorite, but the scene where Kier is in the carriage and sees the paper and realizes that, you know, all of his memories start flooding back. That was really well written. I loved that. And then of course, all the wallflowers. So 3.5. And the song I feel would be good for them is a really sensual song based a lot on physical love, which I feel like is perfect for this couple. Come on, get higher by Matt Nathanson. And he talks about faith and desire, which is what they have plenty of. Plenty of desire and I guess faith that they're going to make it work because there's, they're not, there's not a lot else to build on. So there you have it. That was the last book of the 19, if you include the wedding novella for the Hathaways. 19 books. It's crazy. A lot has happened. I might do a video just about all that happened <laughs> with all 18 books. It's just crazy. But um, I so enjoyed this. I am not gonna know what to do with myself, except that I am gonna be doing some Halloween spooky type vlogs coming up, but not having Lisa Kleypas every week is gonna be so strange. But I do think a little break is in order. I was gonna go straight to Gamblers of Cravens, but I'm gonna take a little break so I can appreciate her all over again, so. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I hope you're enjoying whatever it is that you're reading. And until next time, thanks so much. Take care. Bye.